Hey guys, welcome to my Blood, Blow, Blood Bowl tutorial. I've tried this a couple times, but my mic keeps messing up, so hopefully this will work. Um, instead of trying to teach you in my Let's Plays, and I'll still probably point stuff out in my normal Let's Plays, I thought I'd run you through the tutorial that comes with the game. It's a short tutorial, it's about 20 minutes long, I think. This is purely for you to kind of get an idea of how the rules work. What I'm going to do is post a link to the rules on the website. The rules are totally free. They'll be they'll be below the video here. The, they're totally free online. They're offered. It's mostly to get people involved in this. So um, I'm going to let the machine walk us through it and then just add my two cents worth. And then hopefully the next Let's Play after this will be an actual game. So um, here we go. Good evening, sports fans, and welcome to the Blood Bowl for tonight's contest. You join a capacity crowd packed with members of every race from across the known world, all howling like banshees in anticipation of tonight's game. Oh, and yes, there are some actual banshees. Well, kickoff is in about 20 minutes' time, so we've just got time to recap the rules of the game before the battle starts. Your match commentators for tonight are Jim and myself, Bob Bifford. Evening, Jim. Thank you, Bob. Well, good evening, and boy, are you folks in for a great night of top-class sporting entertainment. But first of all, for those at home who are unfamiliar with the rules, here's how the game is transmitted to the folks at home, and of course, play. Let me explain that, Jim. As any Blood Bowl fan knows, each Blood Bowl match is transmitted out to thousands of Blood Bowl fans with the device <laughs> Campaign for Real Arcanery. The camera that was developed by the Guilds of Magic. A bound spirit in a box is allowed to look out in one direction only at the Blood Bowl field. And his mental image is then transmitted by teams of magicians using the spell Cablevision. So I'm going to move the camera around using the arrows key. So this is the up key, the down key, the left key. And nowadays and right. we've got a lot of cameras, Bob. Since transmitting Blood Bowl matches became a huge success, a lot more broadcasting guilds emerged on the market, such as NBC. Necromancer's Broadcasting Circle. Channel 7, the CBS. Crystal Ball Service. To name a few, but since ABC... Association of Broadcasting Conjurers. Yes, thank you, Bob. Since the ABC won the franchise in 2486, when it was renewed for the 30th time, they have exclusive broadcasting rights nowadays. Okay, so I'm going to switch it between the views by hitting the C key. It'll basically spin it around so I can see the different sides of the players. So this is the first press, so from the back, second press from the left side. That's too true, Jim. But let's explain for the folks at home what Blood Bowl the game really is. Blood Bowl is an epic conflict between two teams of heavily armored and quite insane warriors. Players pass, throw, or run with the ball, attempting to get it to the other end of the pitch, the end zone. Of course, the other team must try to stop them and recover the ball for their side. If a team gets the ball over the line into the opponent's end zone, it's called a touchdown. The team that scores the most touchdowns by the end of the match wins the game and are declared Blood Bowl champions. How do they do it? Okay, I didn't hit C quick enough. I should have been able to spin you all the way around, but it didn't work. So I just wanted to let you know you can see all four views. It's like this, Bob. Two teams set up 11 players on the pitch. 11 is the sacred number of Nuffle, as any hardcore Blood Bowl fan would know. Today, we're going to watch the Gouged Eye against the Reichland Reavers. This is yet another grudge match between the two teams. And it seems the teams are entering the pitch now. Shall we get started, Jim? The coin is flipped high in the air, and the brave goblin referee announced that the Reichland Reavers will be receiving this half. Now, quickly before we get into the actual game, the world is set in a Warhammer Fantasy roleplay world. There's a tabletop armies game that fight each other. There's video games about it. There's role-playing games. It's sort of like D&D, but it's on basically D&D on crack. It's a lot darker, a lot deadlier. It's a way cool world. Right. Let's get started. As any coach will tell you, Bob, a team's starting formation is vitally important. 
Here we can see an example of the gouged eye famous 542 or deep defense formation. This formation is used by the eye against fast moving or agile teams like Skaven or Elves. Some would argue with limited success. You said it, Jim. Notice how the gouged eye has made sure that there are no gaps in their line for opposing players to run through. Every square is covered by an orc player or one of his tackle zones. I'm going to display the tackle zone by pressing a G. I actually didn't realize I could get it to display. I just knew that they were there from playing the tabletop version of the game. That's absolutely right, Bob. Each square around a player is a tackle zone. And it looks like, as an added insurance, the Orcs have kept two players back deep, close to their own end zone, so they can catch any enemy players lucky enough to dodge their way through the Orc front line. Jim, let's not forget that a team can only field two players in each wide zone, and they always have to field a minimum of three players on the halfway line, which coaches refer to as the line of scrimmage. Okay, really brief. Line of scrimmage is the halfway point in the thing. You have to have three people up on the line, and it could be either in the outside areas or the inner area, and the wide zone they're talking about is the outside, this outside strip on each side. So the up above with these, with these two, and then there's two there. After the start of the game, you can have as many as you want in those zones. It's just for setup that you have that. Okay, Bob. It seems like Reichland Reavers have set up their offensive lineup and that the gouged eye are <coughs> ready to kick the ball. It sure does, Jim. When both teams have finished their setup, the coach of the kicking team places the ball in any square in the opponent's half of the pitch. That's right, Bob. He can even place it in their end zone if he likes. After placing the ball, it will scatter in random direction, though, only up to a maximum of seven squares in any of the eight possible directions. Those kicks are sure inaccurate, Jim. That's why coaches sometimes prefer to field the player with the kick skill, since it will cut the number of possible squares the ball will scatter by half. But more on those skills later. That's right, Bob. The kick skill sure is useful, because if the ball bounces off the pitch or into the kicking team's half, the receiving team is awarded a touchback and can give the ball to any player in their team. There goes the little referee with his bone whistle. It's time to rumble! Okay, you place the... you right-click the area that you want. And look at that kick, Jim! What a perfect kick by Truck Elf Splitter. But what's up with the fans, Jim? Okay, there's a event each time you kick off the ball or you receive the ball. They roll on the chart. I'm going to read it to you because I don't know if you'll be able to read this on the screen. For This is the result for this kickoff. The kickoff table. Six. Cheering fans. Each coach rolls a die and adds their fame and the number of cheerleaders on their team to the score. The team with the highest score is inspired by their fans cheering and gets an extra reroll this half. If both teams have the same score, then both teams get a reroll. In this case, the Reichland Reavers ha roll a three. They have zero fame, which is zero fan factor, and three cheerleaders. That means they got a six. While the gouged die rolled a one, they have zero fame and three cheerleaders, and it's, that gives them a four. The result is the Reichland Reavers get an extra team reroll. Now, when you make these teams, you get a certain amount of gold crowns to buy the different things, to buy all the players, because each player costs different. You can also buy cheerleaders, you can buy fan factor, you can buy an apothecary, which helps you reroll when one of your guys gets injured or killed. So the teams are all a lot different. It might seem like they're going to come out the same. They're not. They're a lot different, and each team's stats are different. So here we go. As you know, Bob, all kinds of things can happen during a Blood Bowl match. A team may make an inspired play, or raucous fans might throw a rock at one of the opposing team's players, or even invade the pitch. Coaches refer to them as kickoff events. There are lots of different outcomes. In this case, the cheering fans seem to have gone wild with anticipation. Right, Jim. Keep an eye on those fans. It seems Reichland Reavers got inspired by their fans cheering and got an extra reroll in this half. No doubt their cheerleaders got the crowd going. Equally important is their assistant coaches and fame, fan factor, during the kickoff events. Now, the big thing you'll know, I'll show this to you really quick, 
is I selected the guy closest to the ball. And when you select him, down on the lower right-hand corner, you'll see his stats pop up, much like the NFL or whatever. And you'll see at the top it says thrower. That's his position. His name is Fat Mitbrot. There is M-A-S-T-A-G-N-A-V. M-A is movement allowance. How many squares can he move? Six squares. Strength of three and agility of three, which are both considered average. And an AV is armor value, eight. So when he gets knocked down, you roll 2d6 in the old tabletop, and it's the same for the game here, just the computer does it. You roll 2d6, and if you get higher than that number, they get injured. There's an injury table. And you'll notice on the right-hand side, it says pass and sure hands. Those are his special skills for his position that he receives. And then finally, what I didn't say at the very, very top in white letters, there's a number one, that's his first level, and it's zero slash six skill point, SP, SPP. And zero means he's received zero of six star player points. When he gets six star player points for catch and throw, and every time he does something successfully, he gets a point. When he gets to the second level, he gets to select either a new skill or a higher stat. So that's kind of the build-up. Here we go. And that extra team re-roll sure is handy for the Reavers, Bob. It allows them to re-roll one dice roll per turn during a half. Re-rolls are very important in Blood Bowl, as coaches quickly discover. There are two types of re-rolls, team re-rolls and player re-rolls. In either case, a re-roll allows you to re-roll all the dice that produced any one result. As if we didn't say the word re-roll enough in that paragraph. It sure is useful, Jim. So let's continue with the match, shall we? It seems like the Reichland Reavers thrower, Fat Midbro, is getting ready to pick up the ball, and the ball is just within his reach since he got movement allowance six. By the way, the actual game is a lot quicker since you don't have to walk through each screen. Okay, you right-click it once to select which square, and then you right-click it a second time to have him go pick it up. Oh, take a look at that, Bob. He almost failed to pick up the ball. Luckily enough for the Reavers, Fat Mitbrot has the sure hand skill, which allowed him to re-roll the pickup roll, and he made it on the second attempt. True, Jim. Sure hands does come in handy at times. Maybe we should mention that the agility table is used for more than just pickups, Jim. It is also used to work out the success or failure of a number of different actions in Blood Bowl, including dodging, picking up the ball, and throwing or catching the ball, to name but a few. Each action has its own set of modifiers, too, depending on how difficult the action is. It's these modifiers to the dice roll that affect whether or not the action is a success. That's right, Bob. This all might sound complicated, but it's really easy to understand it all after a few games. For those that wish to broaden their wisdom about Blood Bowl, I recommend taking a look at the official Blood Bowl rule. Once again, I will link to either my journal post that goes with this, or to the YouTube channel, you know, comment area below the video, the actual location of that book. It's actually not very big, and it's got some cool history about it, too. Okay, and if you want to move them, you right-click on the part of the, the square you want them to go to. You said it, Jim. But look at that. He's not done. He's about to throw a short pass to Griff Oberwald. That's a risky play so early in the turn, Bob. Usually, coaches try to perform the easier actions first during their turn. Because if anyone fails an action, it's the end of their turn. In this case, it's fairly safe, since Fat Mitbrot also has the pass skill, which allows him to re-roll a failed result. Still a risky play, Jim. Since the thrower has agility of three, which means that he must roll a four or more to be on target. No modifiers apply to the D6 roll because he is not in any tackle zones. And the modifier for short pass is... Okay, so I'm going to throw the ball. You put the right hand on, you click, and you throw. And he rolls a four and makes it. And Griff Oberwald reaches for the ball and rolls a two. He catches the ball. What an amazing play so early in the game, Bob. For those that wish to view the agility table for passing the ball and catching the ball, we refer yet again to the Blood Bowl rulebook. 